All right, welcome back. So we've been talking about complex functions and specifically analytic complex functions where we essentially have uh, enough of a well-defined you know, notion of a derivative that we can do calculus, we have Taylor series. Now we're gonna talk about kind of what integrals look like in the complex plane. So, you know, we spent a lot of time looking at derivatives. We found weird properties like the derivative of a complex function sometimes depends on the direction, uh, you know, of kind of how I approach that point. But for analytic functions, the derivative is independent uh, of the way that we approach that point in the complex plane. <clears throat> Today we're gonna talk about complex integrals. And specifically, we're going to be talking about uh, a function. So given a function f of z, and we're going to break this up into its real and its imaginary part. So we're going to say f of z has a real part u of x comma y plus i of v, sorry, i v of x comma y. Uh, and of course, you know, where uh, my function, my, my variable z equals x plus i y. x is the real part, y is the imaginary part of my complex variable z. And my function f has a real part uh, u, which is a function, and a re an imaginary part v, which is a function. We're gonna be talking about computing the integral of this function f over paths in the complex plane. Maybe closed circles, maybe you know, a path from point z not to z1. And we're gonna see uh, you know, when does that integral depend on the path I take? When are those integrals equal to zero? Things like that. And you might ask yourself, why would I care about integrals in the complex plane? I live in the real world, I'm a real valued human. Uh, why do I care about things like, uh, you know, a, let's say that this is my real part and this is my imaginary part and this is my complex plane. Why should I care about, uh, you know, the integral from one point to another in the complex plane? Now, one of the, the reasons is, of course, that you get to impress all of your friends at your next party uh, with how complicated of an integral you can do, uh, you know, on the back of an envelope. You can really solve some pretty hairy, definite integrals using uh, integrals in the complex plane. In fact, kind of in the olden days before, you know, Mathematica and Wolfram Alpha and numerical computation, there were nasty real valued integrals, integrals that matter to real humans like us, that you could kind of only solve by extending that real valued integral into the complex plane and using some of the fancy complex integral tricks I'm gonna show you in this lecture and the next couple of lectures. That's that's one reason, that's kind of a superficial reason. And realistically, nowadays, we have computers, you probably don't need, uh, unless you're on a desert island, you don't need to you know, often do these integrals in the complex plane, we have computers for these. Now, if you're on a desert island and you wanna design an airfoil, again, you're going to be needing to do integrals in the complex plane. When I compute the lift over an analytic, kind of an idealized airfoil using potential flow, I'm definitely using complex uh, integrals. So it's really good for building intuition for things like you know, flow over wings or electrostatic potentials or steady state heat equations. We might need kind of the intuition of, of the complex plane that we can use when we then uh, extend these into really uh, you know, modern numerical computations of these things. One of the areas that this is the most important is when we do inverse Laplace transforms. So the inverse Laplace transform is going to involve a complex integral, an integral, uh, a closed loop integral in the complex plane. And we are only going to be able to solve that once I show you all of the kind of uh, tricks and theorems and facts and properties and intuition of integrals in the complex plane. So if you are serious about you know, control theory, uh, partial differential equations, uh, fluid dynamics, physics, you might not use these for day-to-day -day computations anymore, but this is still one of the underpinnings of how we understand the computations that we do uh, outsource to our computers. Okay, um, integrals in the complex plane. So we're talking about these functions of a complex variable z that have a real and imaginary part. Uh, and I'm just gonna write out a couple of properties uh, of this really, really quickly so that um, um, essentially, so, so, so that you can see how this expands out. So if I have a function f of z, uh, then 
you can see I've been in the complex plane a lot. I just put down one blue pen and picked up another blue pen. Uh, then the contour integral, some integral, and I actually don't have to say that it's a closed contour or an open contour, just some integral over some contour C from some point to some other point. It could come back to itself, that's fine. The integral of some contour uh, C of my function f of z with respect to the z variable. Uh, and I'm going to expand this times dz. This is going to equal um, u plus iv. That's just f. This is the integral of u plus iv times dz, which is just dx plus i dy. And this is actually super simple. We're just going to you know, multiply all four cross terms and collect the reals and the imaginaries. And so that equals, uh, that equals the integral over my contour of all the real stuff is going to be u dx minus, so i times i is minus, minus v dy. That's all the real stuff plus i times all the complex stuff, which is u i dy, so u dy plus v dx. Okay, so this is just what happens when I take a complex function times dz and I expand it out, and we're gonna integrate this over contour c from, you know, maybe from some point uh, z naught to z1, maybe we will uh, integrate from z0 back to itself, so a closed contour, and we're gonna see what happens when this function is analytic and when this function is not analytic. Very uh, important cases here, okay? So that's where we're going with this. Um, and anything I wanna point out before I get into kind of the theorem, what you should notice already is that this expression here looks a lot like something that we can transform using Green's uh, theorem, which is kind of the 2D version of Stokes' theorem from vector calculus. And this also looks strikingly like the form that we saw in the cauchy riemann conditions earlier. So, you know, kind of hint or, or, or teaser, if my function f is analytic and it satisfies the cauchy riemann conditions, I might be able to simplify or even cancel out some of these expressions. So that's, that's what we're gonna see. Um, Good, and I think what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to uh, write down this cauchy uh, gorsaw theorem over here because this is super duper important. So the Cauchy, not Cauchy, cauchy gorsaw theorem. Uh, please, someone in the comments, tell me if gorsaw is on the Eiffel Tower. I can't remember. Uh, and this is an important one. This is important. This is one of my favorite ones. It's kind of a cornerstone. I'll be honest with you, I'm not going to tell you any complex integral formulas or theorems that I found boring. I found, you know, I took a 15-week complex analysis class and I distilled it down to the two weeks I think you need to know. So yeah, I'm going to put important near almost all of the theorems because I only pick the ones I think are important. Okay, so um, if my function f is analytic, in a closed, uh, in, a, in a domain, so let me just think about how to say this. If f of z is analytic, is analytic, and I'm gonna say this two or three different ways using kind of mathematical, legalistic uh, lawyer speak, and you're gonna realize why I have to be particular about how I say this. If f of z is analytic uh, inside and on, a closed, a closed, a simple, I'll tell you what I mean by a simple closed curve C, which is, this, which is inside the complex plane. If F is analytic everywhere inside of a simple closed curve C in the complex plane, then the integral, the, the closed integral over C of F of Z dz equals zero. This is the cauchy gorsaw integral formula theorem, and it's very, very important. So um, maybe I'll draw one more uh, curve in the complex plane to give you an idea of what I mean, so real and imaginary. Uh, here what we're talking about is this closed curve C 
that loops back on itself. And the convention in complex uh, analysis is that these curves are typically uh, counterclockwise, so they go kind of, so I'm integrating in this direction. Um, this is important later, it's not important for this because it doesn't matter if I integrate clockwise or counterclockwise, it's still zero. But later when we integrate around uh, non-analytic points, it will certainly matter if it's clockwise or counterclockwise. Remember going up that, that logarithm infinite spiral staircase, if you go clockwise, you uh, counterclockwise, you go up. If you go clockwise, you go down. Uh, maybe there's religious uh, overtones, I'm not sure. So this is my contour C. Uh, which is closed and simple, so it's a closed contour, it's just a loop, okay? And what we are assuming is that my function f is analytic everywhere inside and on this contour c, meaning there's no singularities, there's no cusps, there's no cliffs, uh, kind of like, you know, th there's nothing weird happening inside of here, it's just an analytic function like z squared or z cubed or e to the z or cosine of z where it's analytic inside of here. So what I'm actually gonna do is I'm going to basically draw some domain D, and I'm gonna say that it's analytic everywhere inside of this domain D. So it's analytic inside. Okay, so as long as my closed contour C is kind of inside of an analytic domain, and it's analytic everywhere inside of there, it's analytic in here as well, okay, it's analytic all the way inside of that closed curve, then this integral around this closed loop equals zero. Now, um, intuitively, if you like physics or engineering like I do, I like engineering more than physics sometimes, uh, then this feels a lot like a conservative vector field, right? So like a potential, uh, a potential function. So if I look at my gravitational potential and I hike up a mountain and I hike down the mountain, if there's no friction or losses, then you know, the total uh, gain in energy around that closed loop is zero because it's a potential function. It's the, uh, you know, that, that vector field that I'm fighting against is the gradient of a potential function. And so I have this kind of conservative property that the integral equals zero. This is a theorem I'm actually gonna prove because uh, it's uh, intuitive and it actually illustrates something useful to prove it. If I don't prove something for you, it's probably because it's either too complicated or it's not that enlightening. This one it's actually enlightening to prove. So I'm gonna prove uh, proof. Um, this one's not that bad. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this integral of C, and this is a closed contour C uh, of f of z dz, and from over here, what we're gonna do is break this up into the real part and the imaginary part, a real valued integral and an imaginary valued integral. So this is um, this integral over C of u dx minus uh, v dy plus the imaginary uh, integral of C of, what is that? V dx plus u dy, I hope that's right, I think that's right, good. So these are uh, two real valued integrals that I, I've split this up into two real valued integrals, uh, this one plus i times this real valued integral. And now what we're going to do is we're going to see how both of these real valued integrals equal zero as long as my function is analytic everywhere on and inside that, uh, that contour C. And so this is actually pretty simple. We're gonna use Green's, uh, Green's theorem. So kind of, uh, where do I wanna go? Like equals, so this is uh, by Green's theorem. This thing equals, so Green's theorem from vector calculus, and you can go to my vector calculus videos if you like and basically look at Green's theorem or Stokes' theorem. This integral of a closed contour of u dx minus v dy can be written as a surface integral or an area integral of, you know, over all the points inside of C. This can be written as a double integral inside of C, kind of inside this this region uh, that I'm gonna call S over this area S of, uh, and just go, go remind yourself what Green's theorem is, of minus partial, uh, partial V dx minus partial U dy, 
that's what you get when you apply green serum to this. So you basically take the different, diff like uh, if it's UDX, then you get a partial UDY, a minus partial UDY. And if it's VDY, you get a partial VDX. So that's what this is. Um, you know, DX, DY. This is the real valued integral plus this imaginary valued integral, which we can also apply uh, Green's theorem to. So my V dx now becomes partial V partial y, and my U dy becomes partial U partial x. So I get partial U partial uh, x minus partial V partial y. Again, this is dx dy. But the really, really neat thing is, remember our cauchy riemann conditions for an analytic function? Because this is analytic everywhere inside of here, this exactly equals zero, and this exactly equals zero, because our cauchy riemann conditions were that this term equals that term, and this term equals that term. Those were, you know, basically, uh, you know, by cauchy riemann by cauchy Riemann. So go back to the video on Cauchy Riemann, pause it, write down the Cauchy Riemann condition one, Cauchy Riemann condition two, and you'll see clear as day that this whole integrand has to equal zero. Both of these integrands equal zero everywhere that this function is analytic. And since we've specified that this is analytic everywhere inside of this closed contour C, these are both identically equal to zero. So that's kind of why I chose to show you this uh, proof, because it's actually very intuitive and clear how, if you actually write out this kind of expanded uh, form in terms of these, these differential elements, and you apply Green's, uh, Green's theorem, you basically see that if the function is analytic, both the real and the imaginary part of this integral are zero everywhere because of Cauchy-Riemann, because f is analytic, and so this closed contour integral equals zero. And this is super, super useful, this property that the integral over any closed curve of an analytic function that's analytic, you know, kind of everywhere inside that closed curve is equal to zero. We're going to use that to do some pretty interesting things in the complex plane. We're going to do surgery to, you know, deform this thing. We can basically warp this integral and it won't change. We're going to show, for example, one major implication is that, um, if I integrate over two different paths, if I integrate over C1 and I integrate over C2, as long as my function is analytic, you know, kind of uh, everywhere between C1 and C2, the integral does not depend on the path. Super, super interesting, okay? So I get this kind of path independence in the complex plane as long as my function is analytic. Okay, now uh, if there are singular points, like if there's a singular point in the middle, that's not gonna be true, um, but, but let's say, you know, if my function is analytic everywhere or inside of a large domain where I'm considering my trajectories, then that certainly is true. Okay, uh, so what am I going to do? What I'm gonna do next is I'm basically uh, going to show how this cauchy gorsaw theorem uh, implies that the integral is independent of path. Uh, I'm going to also show how that's true a different way. And then I'm going to show that you can do weird things like deform your curves, you can do surgery, um, and kind of show that other curves are equal to zero and things like that. Um, cool, okay. So given this theorem, it's almost kind of obvious that this uh, integral is independent of path now. Because if I write down that I have an integral from, you know, over path C1, which goes from Z0 to Z1 of, you know, F of Z dz. And I have, I'm, I'm claiming that this equals the integral of C2, another uh, curve of that same F of Z dz, because this should be independent uh, of the path. And the reason is, is because that this curve I drew here, I could equally well write it, I'm gonna to try to just be an artist here for a minute. I could basically take, um, you know, and reverse the direction of C2, this is kind of minus C2, the minus C2 direction, and now I have a closed loop. And the integral of that closed loop has to equal zero. So just using some kind of uh, math notation here, I'm gonna say that this equals the integral of C1 
uh, you know, f of z dz minus the integral of c2, f of z dz equals zero, minus the integral of c2 is the same as the integral, you know, in the opposite direction, in the minus c2 direction. So this equals integral of c1, uh, I'm going to say now f of z dz plus the integral in the minus c2 direction of f of z dz. And uh, if I take, you know, in the c1, a, a path in the c1 direction and then in the minus c2 direction, that's a closed contour. I'm going to say that that's a closed contour c. This whole thing here is c of f of z dz, and that of course equals zero by the cauchy gorsaw theorem. So by the cauchy gorsaw theorem, uh, I can kind of show that if I have you know, two points, z0 and z1, and I have a pa two different paths between them uh, inside of an analytic domain, that integral has to equal the same thing if I take path one or path two. And these, uh, these integrals themselves don't equal, sorry, um, these integrals themselves do not equal zero. This implies that when I subtract their integrals, they equal zero. These integrals themselves do not have to equal zero. The integral from z0 to z1 might be, you know, pi or 3 or 10, uh, and it doesn't depend on the path I take, whether it's c1 or c2. Good. Uh, and this is essentially like the fundamental theorem of complex, complex variables, actually. So um, I'm going to erase this, and I'm going to write down the, the fundamental theorem of complex variables. Okay, so the fundamental theorem of complex variables, um, yeah, fundamental, remember the fundamental theorems of calculus? Fundamental theorem of, you know, complex uh, integral calculus. Calculus, uh, the fundamental theorem of complex integral calculus is that if f is analytic in some domain D, uh, which is kind of encapsulating you know, these curves in, in some domain D, and z0 and z1 are in that domain z D, then the integral from z0 to z1 over any path I take that remains in that domain D over c1 or c2 or c3 or whatever, the integral from, from z0 to z1 of f of z dz is equal to some function, you know, f evaluated at z1 minus some function f evaluated at z0. So there is a, a function, which is the integral of f of z. Remember, just like there's a function that's the, der the derivative if I have an analytic function, there is a function, which is the integral of f. And all I have to do is evaluate that function at the endpoint minus the initial point, and it doesn't depend on the path. So for example, you know, if little f of z is equal to z squared, then big F of z is equal to z cubed over 3, right? It's exactly like what you intuit uh, for, comp for, for real valued functions um, in, the, in the complex plane. Now, um, there's something that sometimes I tell my students when I'm in an, an hour-long class, um, and it's a little technical. So I'm going to post a link to the, the PDF notes that I use, kind of my handwritten or, or, or typed up notes uh, about this. But I do think this is kind of interesting, which is um, this function f uh, is the integral of little f. Big F is the, the integral of little f. And this essentially relies on what is known as um, u dx minus uh, v dy and v dx plus u dy, basically the internal parts uh, of the real and imaginary parts of this integral, are what are called exact differentials. Exact differentials. And exact differentials, that, that phrasing basically means um, that uh, u and v satisfy the cauchy riemann conditions. Um, you can kind of verify this for yourself. But what that means is that u equals uh, f sub x and v equals minus f sub y, the, the partial derivative of f with respect to x, the partial derivative of f with respect to y. Uh, we also have, I think, uh, u equals um, 
g sub x and v equals g sub y, where, um, goodness gracious, I should have called this, you know, um, this is some, some complex function f, where complex f is f plus i g. So this, this uh, non-squiggle f is the real part, and this non-squiggle g is the, the imaginary part of this kind of master integral formula uh, integral uh, f tilde. Sorry, that, that's, that's a little confusing. I just used f twice to mean the same thing. When I said that little f integrates to big F, this function has a real and an imaginary part, and I'm calling that real part, you know, capital F, and I'm calling that imaginary part capital G, okay? So I hope that's not, not confusing. Um, and essentially what it means for these to be exact differentials is that U is the, you know, partial of F with respect to X and the partial of G with respect to, um, x and v is minus partial f partial y and v is, is partial g partial y. And you can kind of confirm for yourself just like we did here uh, because these are exact differentials you can write this expression and uh, the cauchy riemann conditions uh, are, are satisfied here. Okay, so um, this is just a technical detail. Maybe, um, you know, if you want to think about this more, you can look at my notes. I make a connection that essentially um, this establishes a conservative vector field in the sense of, you know, vector calculus and partial differential equations, uh, but that's really a detail. So what are, we, uh, what are we finding here? If we have a function f that's analytic inside some domain d where we have a closed contour, then the integral around the, that closed contour is equal to zero because of, you know, Green's theorem and then cauchy riemann And that has the implication that if I have two points, the integral between those two points is independent of the path. Again, because if I take two paths, I can kind of you know, flip one of them, get a closed contour that equals zero. And so the integral of C1 has to equal minus the integral of minus C2, which means the integral along path one has to equal the integral along path two. Very, very cool property. Okay, um, I'm going to show you a couple more things you can do, just kind of what I consider surgery in the complex plane or, you know, deforming these complex curves. So again, I'm going to erase this and then uh, I'll show you what those, what those look like. So just one second. Okay, we just erased the board uh, and moved some stuff over here. So now I'm going to show you how you can uh, continuously deform these contours and not change the value of the integral as long as you are continuously deforming it inside of a analytic region D. Okay, uh, and this is super cool. I think about this as like, um, you know, warping these curves or doing some surgery. And this is, this is one of my kind of favorite pictures I like to, uh, I like to draw in the complex plane. So uh, just to restate Cauchy-Gorsau's integral, uh, integral theorem, this is an integral theorem. Uh, if my function f of z is analytic inside uh, my, my contour c, then the integral of f of z dz equals zero. And so here's where it gets really, really interesting. Um, Let's see how I want to do this. So um, there's actually two important uh, properties I want to show you. So uh, inside, inside uh, an analytic, analytic region or domain D, we can, we can deform, deform, uh, contours continuously. We can deform contours C continuously and not change the value of the integral. And not change the value uh, of the integral. Cool. Uh, and so I'm going to draw two pictures actually because this is it's a super interesting. So, so in the one picture, it's kind of the one I drew here where we have the real uh, and the imaginary, and I have, you know, uh, let's say contour one, and I have contour two. As long as, this one's kind of obvious, as long as these are both inside of a domain D that's, you know, everything inside of here is analytic, uh, 
then uh, the integral of C1 equals the integral of C2. I can kind of deform C1 into C2 and nothing changes. Now this is obvious in a sense because both the integral of C1 and the integral of C2 are both equal to zero. So it's kind of obvious that yes, like every closed curve inside of here has an integral zero. So that's like uh, in some sense trivial. So I'm just going to write this down that the, um, the integral of C1 of f of z dz uh, dz dz equals the integral of C2. These are closed contours of f of z dz. They both equal zero. They're equal to each other and they're equal to zero. But what's really cool is that this is actually true. I can also deform these contours even if my, um, my contour is surrounding some singular points where the function is not analytic. And this is going to be super, super useful later. So the other case that's actually interesting is this case where I have, uh, let's see, maybe I'll use orange. I have some bad points inside of here, some uh, you know, bad points inside of here, some singularities. Okay, so these are singular points. These are, uh, yeah, singular points. So there could be some really bad stuff here, cliffs and cusps and you know, one over z's. Maybe I'm integrating log of z. Uh, you know, and I'm integrating it around um, the origin where we know that it's not analytic. So these are points that are not analytic. Um, let's just say, you know, bad stuff can happen here. There be dragons. But let's say that I have a, I, I have a contour C1 and another contour C2. And let's say that the function is analytic everywhere outside of this region. So let's say that the function away from these bad singularities, it is analytic everywhere. So it's analytic where C1 is, it's analytic where C2 is. I claim that this is still true. The integral around C1 of f of z dz is equal to the integral of C2 of f of z dz, even though now they are not necessarily equal to zero. Because if I, if I integrate around singularities, again, this is some of the next lectures I'm going to show you, we're going to compute how to integrate around weird singularities, like integrate the log function around its origin, uh, which will be 2 pi i, for example, you know, not zero. These integrals around C1 and around C2 might not be zero, like they were in this case, but I can still continuously deform C1 into C2 as long as it, it doesn't pass through any singularities between them. As long as there's no singularities on C1 or C2 or between them, I can deform C1 into C2 and the integral doesn't change. Even if I'm surrounding singularities and I get a non-zero integral for both of them. And the way we show this is super, super cool, uh, is we basically create a new curve where we basically take uh, you know, the C1 curve, so this is kind of C1, and we take our C2 curve, but I'm going to take minus C2. I hope you see where I'm going with this. This is kind of minus the minus C2 curve, because C2 is going in the counterclockwise direction. So if I go in the clockwise direction, I get minus C2. And then I kind of have these, uh, like this little channel here, this like this little up part and this little down part of the connector. And if I take the limit as those become infinitesimally close, they equal each other and they cancel out. So this is super, super cool. So what this says, and again, now, it's a little hard for me to draw this, but because I have this little gap here, everything in here is analytic. And so this actually satisfies the cauchy gorsaw theorem because I have somehow kind of done some surgery and I've created this little you know, topologically distinct blue region that is everything is analytic inside this blue region. That's kind of what I mean by simple and closed. Um, it's kind of simply connected. It's not two different pieces that are disconnected. It's one connected piece. And it can surround bad singularities, but I have made it so that it is not closed around those bad singularities. And what we're going to do is take the limit as this gap goes to zero and those cancel out. And so what I have is because this does satisfy cauchy gorsaw because I have had, had this little tiny surgery, I've done this little incision here, what I get 
uh, is that the integral of C1 plus the integral of minus C2, of minus C2, let's say, you know, uh, plus this integral, plus this integral, but I'm going to take the limit as they go together, so they're going to cancel. So the C1 minus, uh, you know, plus minus C2 adds up to equal zero because it is analytic everywhere inside the simply connected domain. And so what that means is that the integral of C1 of f of z dz is equal to minus the integral, you know, in the clockwise direction, which means it's equal to plus the integral in the regular old counterclockwise C2 direction. That's essentially moving this over to this side and saying that that minus, you know, can mean I can switch the, the direction of C2 back to being counterclockwise from clockwise. And so this is super, super interesting. And again, remember, these are not necessarily equal to zero. Uh, these integrals may very well themselves independently. C1 might not add up to zero. C2 might not add up to zero. But if I go along in C1 and then cut over to minus C2 and then cut back, that total integral equals zero. Good. If I was being really, really clever, or sorry, uh, pedantic and uh, picky, I would say that I also have a, like a, you know, C, uh, you know, an integral of C plus and an integral of C minus, you know, the plus direction and the minus direction, but those are going to cancel out when I take the limit as they get infinitely close because they're, you know, they cancel each other out. So I just need to do this. Okay, good. So this is how we do surgery in the complex plane. Super, super important. And it allows us to continuously deform uh, these contours as long as I'm deforming them in a region that's analytic, if I don't deform them past a singularity. If there was a singularity between these, I wouldn't be able to do it. It would be a no-go. I couldn't do this deformation, and I couldn't use cauchy gorsaw so Cauchy and Gorsaw are the, you know, Cracker Jack surgeons of the complex plane, and they allow us to do really, really fancy uh, kind of manipulations that are going to come in handy uh, later. Okay, good. One last thing I want to show you. This is actually the easiest thing I've shown you. This is all kind of uh, a little bit, you know, takes, uh, takes, it stretches your mind a little bit. The next thing I'm going to show you is actually uh, kind of the easiest integral formula in the complex plane called the ML bound. I'm going to erase this really, really quickly and write that up, and then we'll be done with this lecture. Okay, last thing I want to show you uh, is the easiest kind of integral property in the complex plane, uh, and it's often called the ML bound. Uh, and it's super intuitive. It's almost so obvious you would think, why did I even write this down? But it's going to be really useful later when we take integrals and we take the limit of those integrals as their radius becomes infinite. And sometimes we can kill integrals uh, by kind of continuously deforming them in an analytic regime uh, domain until the radius is zero, uh, is infinity, and we're going to make this integral uh, zero. So if my function f has a norm, like you know, u squared plus v squared, uh, if the norm of f is bounded, is less than or equal to some number m, if it's bounded, it's not infinite, it's less than or equal to m, uh, on, you know, whatever um, this path c, and it doesn't have to be a, a closed orbit, it could be a path from z0 to z1, it could be a closed orbit, doesn't matter, it can, it can contain some singularities or not, doesn't matter. Pretty much any function f, uh, as long as it's bounded on this curve by m, uh, and the length of that curve, the uh, length of that curve, you know, taking the, let's say I have a curve and it's going from here to here, this is curve, and I take, you know, kind of the integral of ds, the kind of little infinitesimal length of this, equals l, so the length of my curve is l, then the integral of that curve, over that curve of f of z dz, the norm of that integral, the, the total magnitude of that integral, if I take that integral and I take its real part squared plus its imaginary part squared square root, this has to be less than m times l. Okay, that's pretty easy. It makes a lot of sense that if, if, uh, if the length of this curve is l, 
and the magnitude of f is never you know, bigger than m, then the total integral over that length of, of f can never be bigger than m times l. That's kind of super intuitive and obvious. This is called the ml bound. But one of the things we're going to be able to do is if we are computing you know, some super hairy integral, you know, uh, over C, and I've got singularities inside, and it's a mess, and I don't know what to do. What I might do, but it's analytic everywhere out here, I might take the limit of that curve, that contour, out to infinity. I might take the radius out to infinity and hope that I can show that F falls off like 1 over R squared, and my length would be something like pi times R, and so if I multiply them, I would show that this equals zero because it has to be less than or equal to something that, as I take the limit as r goes to infinity, is r over r squared, uh, which would be you know, zero. So we'll use the ML bound for things like that uh, later on, but it's just kind of a very intuitive and simple property. Okay, lots of good, good stuff in this lecture. We're talking about how to do integrals in the complex plane. Of course, you can use this to impress your friends at parties. Um, the cauchy gorsaw integral theorem uses the analyticity, that's a word, uh, of our function f inside a closed uh, curve c to show that that integral equals zero. And you can do all kinds of interesting things like show that integrals are path independent in, in uh, analytic domains. You can do surgery uh, to show that one curve can be continuously deformed to the other, uh, and so on and so forth. So we're going to use this all coming up soon. Thank you.